Well, today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 5, beginning in verse uh, 21, and we'll read down through verse 24. The title of the message is Walking with God. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God for 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. The entire lifetime of Enoch was 365 years. He walked with God, and then he disappeared because God took him away. Now, you know, there's very little in the Bible that actually explains who Enoch is, what happened to him as far as him walking with God, and then he disappeared. And uh, there are some people, you know, they want to know what, what went on between Enoch and God. And I don't know if it was uh, that God walked with them and there was some type of a theophany where God appeared to him in a special way. Uh, I don't know if Enoch was hearing a vo the, the voice of God when he walked with them like Adam and Eve did and like uh, Elisha did when he was on the mountaintop and wanted God to reveal himself to him and it wasn't, in the, it wasn't in the wind, it wasn't in the fire, but it's a still small voice. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. So I, I'm not going to attempt to say this is exactly what was happening here, but we know that Enoch had a very close relationship with God. In Hebrews 11 mentions him in that great hall of fame in verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God, and without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So evidently, Enoch believed that he that he existed because he walked in a way that pleased God and uh, he was commended because he pleased God and we're told that without faith it's impossible to please God so we know he was a man of faith. Now there's something interesting back in, the, in, in Genesis the word for walked in the, in the Septuagint which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text the word that was used there for walked is the same word that is used here in in Hebrews 11 for the word pleased. Uh, Euristo is the, is the name of the word. And the, the U part of it means well or good, and then the, the Risto part means, uh, means uh, pleasing. So it was a good and pleasing way that he lived his life, or a very good and pleasing way that he communicated with God that he had this spectacularly uh, unique relationship that God called him home without him even dying. And very few people had that experience in the Bible. Elisha was one of them, and Elijah, and, and, uh, and, and just, just remarkable. So he, there was something extraordinarily pleasing about the way he lived his life, and God blessed him in a very unique way. So walking with God, what should we do if we're going to walk with God? Well, over in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says one of the keys to doing that is to be imitators of God. This is Ephesians 5. 1 through 12, to be imitators of God as beloved children. And that word imitators is the word from which we get our word mimic. You know, we are to mimic the life of Christ. We are to imitate his life. And when we do that, we will walk in a way that is pleasing to God. And the next thing that Paul told the Ephesians was to walk in love as Christ loved us. Don't walk in love the way the world, in the world's concept of love, but if we're going to really walk with Christ in a pleasing way, we're to walk in love as he loved us. We're to mimic that, and he gave himself, and it's described as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And that's what the Old Testament sacrifices were to God, where they were a fragrant offering. You get over to Revelation chapter 5, I believe it's chapter 5, it might be 6, but it speaks about how the, 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 the prayers of the saints are like a, a, a fragrant offering to God. And, uh, and, and so they, they, they go up as incense to God and it's very pleasing to him. So he, Paul paints a picture for us about walking the way Christ walked and walking the way that he loved and he gives us a contrast. Uh, the way Christ is, did it was a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, but it's in stark contrast to the repugnant lifestyle of the lost. 
he describes theirs as a walk of sexual immorality and all impurity, a walk of covetousness. And he said, don't even let this type of lifestyle be named among you. And he says it's not even proper for saints to be identified with it. He goes on to say, let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, no crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. And that's all the world has to offer us are words that are full of promise, but they're empty. There, there is nothing that the world offers that can be satisfying like the relationship we have with Jesus Christ. And he said, do not become partners with them. Now listen carefully. Listen. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. What he is saying is, is if we're really going to identify with God and walk with God, when we come to experience the love of God, we have to walk away from the worldly concept of love. Uh, and he says, you were that way at one time, you were in darkness, but now you've come to the light. What he is saying is, now listen carefully, is if you're going to claim to walk with God and know Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you come to know him, there's going to be a change in your life. And people are going to be, see, be able to see that life because you're no longer living in the darkness, but you're walking as children of light. And he goes on to say, For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Well, walking with God involves, to begin with, a divine inspection. In Genesis chapter 17, the first two verses, we're told that when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Now, I don't know about you, but that would get my attention if the Lord appeared to me and said, I'm God Almighty. I, I would hope I would be like John was in the Revelation and fall on my face as though I were dead when I saw, would see God in his splendor and glory. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. That, and that's the stipulation. Walk before me and be blameless. Then, this is the promise, Keep the stipulation, then here's the promise. I will make my covenant between me and you and will in greatly increase your numbers. So if we're going to walk with God, it, divine, it, it involves a divine inspection. We're to walk faithfully and blamelessly. In Psalm 119, 1 through, threat, 1 through 3, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. If we're going to live a life of faith, if we're going to live a life that is blameless in comparison to the world, we're going to have to walk in the precepts and principles of God's word. And the psalmist goes on to say, Blessed are those who, those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. There's something else walking with God. It involves a divine connection. Over in Genesis 5.22, where we started this morning, after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. You know, we have trouble walking faithfully for 70 years, you know, but, uh, but Enoch did it for 300 years. You know, they didn't have all of the diseases that we have today. They lived a little longer. Spurgeon, the old prince of preachers, once said, you cannot consciously walk with a person whose existence is not known to you. When we walk with a man, we know that he is there. We hear his, we hear his footfall. If we cannot see his face, we, ha uh, we have some very clear perception that there is such a person at our side. The other day, I, I, I called my wife's attention to something. I said, you know the one guy that walks by here, and, and, uh, and he, he, he's an alcoholic. He doesn't evidently have a vehicle to drive, probably doesn't have a driver's license, but he walks the path several times a week and I told my wife I knew he was coming because I, I couldn't see him but I could hear the shuffle of his feet before he even got close to the house there's just a shuffle the way he walks and I didn't realize I had become aware and so when I hear the shuffle I know it's this guy I can look up there he is I go out and talk to him once in a while but uh, that's what Spurgeon is saying 
we get to, to where when we walk with a person enough, we, we know what their footsteps are like. And when we walk with God enough, we know what he expects us to do and how he wants us to walk and how we ought to identify with him. The prophet Amos said, can two walk together unless they are agreed? We will not walk in step with God when we are out of his will because we're uncomfortable doing it then, but when we repent and get right with God, we'll walk in step with him again. Spurgeon also said, if men walk contrary to God, he will not walk with them, but contrary to them. Walking together implies amity, friendship, intimacy, love, and these cannot exist between God and the soul unless the man is acceptable unto the Lord. And the only way it's going to be that way, folks, is when we read and heed his word that we live within the principles and precepts of God's word. A walk with God also involves a divine direction. In Deuteronomy 13 and verse number 4, it is the Lord your God you must follow, and him you must revere, keep his commands and obey him, serve him and hold fast to him. You see, we've got a divine direction. God gave it to Moses, and Moses gave, Moses gave it to his people, and what God com communicated to Moses is the heart of what is communicated in the New Testament. It's obedience to God. And if you'll read the little quotes we've got in the bulletin today when you get home, you'll see that obedience is something that's very important. In Psalm 25, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Now notice this. Make me, teach me, teach me, okay? Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. When we use Psalm 25 as a prayer and we're serious about it, we will nurture our relationship with God. The psalmist said in Psalm 1611, You make known to me the path of light. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now listen to this. You not make known to me the path of life. So if there is a path of life, logically there must be a path of death. And we want God to make known to us the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Logically that means that outside of God's presence there is not joy, but there is misery. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore, which logically would mean that if we are not right in fellowshipping with God, we're not going to enjoy the pleasures forevermore, and we're in danger of damnation forevermore. There's also a divine reflection involved in this walk. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, so then, just as you have received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to walk in him. Paul says, you received him as your Lord. Now it's necessary to reflect on your relationship and to continue to walk in him, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. You know, you can go out, uh, my, my tomato plants are... Are, are suffering from the from the uh, the, the hard uh, summer that we've had with the heat and everything, but you know when they were really growing great, and I'm still getting some tomatoes. But if I'd gone up and uprooted them and taken them out of the soil and just set them aside, they'd have died right away, because they were no longer established in the soil. They were no longer rooted in the soil, and so they could not overflow with the tomatoes. And what the point is here, if we do not sink our roots deep down into God's word, we will wither and we will die on the vine. We need to continue to walk in him. We need to continue to reflect on his goodness and grace and mercy and use it as a check and balance for our lives in 1 John 2. Verses 1 through 6, John said, my little children, John's an old man now. Might be as old as 90, I'm not sure. And so he's kind of writing as a grandfather to his grandkids, and he's wanting, wanting to give him some lessons on life. And he says, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, and the language there is you're not supposed to ever sin, but in as much as you will sin at some time, I want you to know that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. 
He pleads our case before God and he's seated at the right hand of God because Paul said there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all. So we've got this advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous one who pleads our case and John describes him as our atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And he says... This is how we know that we know him if we keep his commands, if we spend times of reflection on his command, and if we obey them. Jesus said, uh, uh, if, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. But he says, this is how we know that we know him. The one who says, I've come to know him and yet doesn't keep his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. He's not living a life that reflects the goodness and grace of God. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him the love of God is made complete. This is how we know that we are in him. The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. Now I want you to know, every day of my life I, ha- I face some kind of a struggle. And, and if I do not start my day in the Bible... If I do not start it some time with prayer, if I do not start it with the daily devotional that I put on on, on our Facebook page, sometime during the day, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Now, I usually do it more than once, but but I'll guarantee you I'm going to do it at least once if I don't start my day that way. And when it happens, I go back and I think, "Uh uh-huh, you were too lax this morning and you you didn't practice the spiritual disciplines. But, you know, there's the old cliche, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Well, if we're going to act like we're Christians, we need to uh, walk like Christians, we need to talk like Christians, and we need to obey the Word of God. And Paul tells us in Colossians 3 how to do it, verses 7 through 17. To begin with, Paul says we need to put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetous, which is idolatry. And on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. You get over to Galatians, and Paul says that he crucified himself daily. He said, I have a daily battle I've got to fight. We also have that. Being a Christian does not make us immune from the temptation of the flesh and sin. But we've got to battle that by walking with Christ and reflecting on his word. Now notice again, in these you too once walked. That's just what what we heard earlier, wasn't it? In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Paul is saying the same thing John said and the other writers of the New Testament said that when we come to Christ there needs to be a change in our life and we should not live by the desires of the old life but we ought to put on the new life which is Jesus Christ. But now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. You see the reflection there reflecting on Jesus Christ. But I want you to get this. It's the idea that we're putting it on every day so that we're being renewed more every day. It's not a process. Christianity is not a process of of, 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 uh, you get saved and no more problems. It's a process of daily becoming more like Jesus. And it's, it's the metamorphosis of the saints. And we keep, ought to keep changing and becoming more like him every day. In verse number 12, Paul went on and said, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive others. And he says, And above all this, put on love which binds together in perfect harmony and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Dwight Pentecost once said, by the way, if you want to learn anything about about prophecy, get Dwight Pentecost's book. It's about this thick and it's it's titled Things to Come. But Pentecost said, when did the servant have the right to give orders to his master? When did the bond slave have a right to question the commands of his Lord? 
By what right do you who know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior set in judgment on the Word of God and the will of God when God demands absolute obedience to it? If we're going to walk with Christ, we need to be obedient to him. And to walk with God, we need to walk in humility. And that's what Paul said in Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. If we're going to walk with God, we need to walk in the light. As Paul said in Romans 13, we need to cast off the work of darkness and put on the armor of light. If we're going to walk with God, we need to walk in a manner that's pleasing to God, according to Colossians 1.10. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And that word pleasing is the same Greek word we were talking about, about Enoch's walk was pleasing with God. And a walk that's pleasing with God is bearing fruit, it's increasing in knowledge, it's being strengthened with all power, according to God's glorious might for all endurance and patience, and it's a walk that gives thanks to God. I'm going to wrap this up with Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with every good to do his will, Working in us what is pleasing, there's our word again, in his sight. And how do we do it? Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. He'll equip you with every good thing according to his will. Working in us what is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ. To walk with God, we are equipped through Jesus Christ. We'll be fully and completely furnished and equipped to live the life that he wants us to live. And he gave us all we need to do it. We trusted him for salvation and claimed him as our Lord and Savior. He gave us everything that we need. He equipped us. Now we need to walk with him. And he'll make sure the equipment fits. And he'll lead us down the way and he'll give us the strength and the guidance that we need every day. Let's pray. Well, Father, as we come now, I want to thank you for this time together. And, Father, I pray that your spirit will bear witness with our spirit today, Lord, that we will endeavor to live a life that is pleasing to you, Father, that we can walk like Jesus walked, like Enoch walked, that we can live a life that's pleasing to you like Elisha and Elijah did, other individuals that you translated. And, Father, that we can walk in a way that people can say, hey, I hear in that shuffle, in that step, that that's part, that person is walking in tune with Jesus. And as Father, as we strive to be more like him, may people see more of you in us. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we sing a song of invitation. I invite you to come today, whatever you need might be, come as we sing this song.